Okay, everybody, let's kick off our three 10 minute talks by our distinguished speakers. Our first speaker, I'm delighted to introduce you to Jeffrey Ellis from the USGS. And he'll set the stage for us this evening by discussing the increasing investments in natural hydrogen, its growth trajectory. And he'll also delve into methods employed in exploring natural hydrogen, touching those synergies with our very own project Interspace Phase One mapping product. And in particular, heat flow, tectonics, and maybe a little bit in sediment thickness. So without any more time delays, Jeffrey, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, as Helen mentioned, I will talk to you about uh, what, what is known about the potential for natural hydrogen resources and, and introduce some concepts about um, how exploration strategies for uh, natural hydrogen and geothermal resources can potentially align. Uh, so uh, to start, let's just talk about uh, hydrogen. Today, uh, the, globally, the world produces about 100 million metric tons or megatons of hydrogen. And that hydrogen is made from fossil fuels, from uh, natural gas and coal. Uh, but it's thought that, that going forward into the future, we can expect that the um, demand for hydrogen will increase. And this increased demand is expected to be needed to, uh, to decarbonize certain hard to abate energy sectors, things like aviation and heavy duty uh, industrial processes. And most projections uh, uh, assume that this uh, additional or new hydrogen production will come from a, a couple of sources. Uh, the first being uh, so-called blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen that's made uh, from fossil fuels, but then coupled with carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And, and a second source is uh, so-called green hydrogen, which is hydrogen made from electrolysis of water using renewable uh, electricity. Um, but there are um, likely to be certain challenges with, with meeting this, this demand for, for new hydrogen from these sources, uh, given the, the technologies that we have today and how expensive they are and how mineral intensive they are. Um, but importantly, in all of these scenarios, um, hydrogen is viewed exclusively as a medium for energy storage and transport and not a primary energy resource. And what I'd like to discuss with you today now is what is the resource potential of natural hydrogen? So uh, hydrogen is actually ubiquitous on Earth. It's in the air that we breathe at about a half a part per million. The world's oceans are super saturated with respect to hydrogen. We uh, observe it in soils and in, in deep mines and in, in underground uh, boreholes. This uh, map here shows a distribution of observations of hydrogen concentrations in excess of 10 mole percent. And you can clearly see that, that um, the hydrogen is observed all over the, the, the planet. Uh, this, this pie chart shows uh, a breakdown of, of hydrogen concentration, median hydrogen concentrations by different geologic settings. And we see that the highest concentrations are associated with things like mid-ocean ridges um, and volcanic magmatic settings or, or um, uh, hydrothermally altered iron-rich rocks that we call serpentinites. Um, but what's uh, of particular note here is that the uh, settings where we have fossil fuels, the conventional uh, petroleum reservoirs, and shales and coals, they typically have very, very low concentrations of hydrogen associated with them. And so for this reason, uh, geoscientists have assumed that we probably can't get accumulations of natural hydrogen. And we think that it's because the, the, the small size of the hydrogen molecule makes it so uh, diffusive that it, it seeps through small pores in, in, in rocks. And also the fact that it's very reactive, uh, both um, biologically as well as uh, through abiotic processes, that, that we, th we think that, that that's why we don't see it associated with these uh, petroleum fluids and that it's probably not possible to, to get accumulations of natural hydrogen. But there are um, some important reasons to, to question this, this assumption that you can't get hydrogen accumulations. Um, the first being that, that the, um, the geologic settings where we would expect the most hydrogen to be generated, these mid-ocean ridges or volcanic, magmatic, and hydrothermal settings, these are not the places where we look for oil and gas. Oil and gas exploration is typically uh, conducted in sedimentary basins. Additionally, petroleum exploration is not targeting hy hydrogen. Uh, in fact, the, the oil and gas industry spends billions of dollars every year, has very sophisticated technologies, and yet they still uh, drill dry holes where they don't find hydrocarbons. And so we shouldn't really expect that we would be finding a lot of hydrogen if we were not actually looking for it. Uh, 
moreover, the, the process, the, the, the reactions that, that generate hydrocarbons from organic rich rocks, which are the source rocks for petroleum, that process is actually a hydrogen limited process. And so if you have an external supply of hydrogen and hydrogen moving through the subsurface and it encounters these organic rich rocks that are generating hydrocarbons, that hydrogen will get a, a, a uh, incorporated into the hydrocarbons. And so we really shouldn't expect to find free hydrogen and gas associated with, with other uh, petroleum gases. Now, it's important to recognize that, that uh, these geologic settings, these hydrothermal, volcanic, magmatic settings are places that mining companies often are active, uh, act actively exploring for, for minerals. Um, but uh, importantly, in mineral exploration, they typically do not look at gas compositions. If they, if they look at gases at all, they're simply uh, concerned about the safety risk of, of encountering uh, explosive gases. And so the, the takeaway really is that we just simply haven't been looking for hydrogen in the right places with the right tools. So if we turn now to a small village called Burake Bugu in the, in the country of Mali in West Africa, there was an accidental discovery of flammable gas in the year 1987 while they were drilling for, for water. And they managed to, to put out the, the fire and, and cap the well and, and produce a uh, drill in another location and produce water. And it was some 25 years later that a, uh, that a petroleum company came back to that site and completed that well and started to produce that gas. And when they looked at the composition, they were surprised to find that the, in fact, the gas was almost pure hydrogen gas. And, and a subsequent uh, exploration campaign that they conducted, uh, they've, they've estimated now that there may be approximately 670 billion cubic feet of essentially pure hydrogen in this one uh, field, which would constitute a, a moderate sized gas field for, for hydrocarbon gases. So in the wake of this discovery in, in Mali, uh, as the news spread, there's been uh, increased exploration activity in other parts of the world. Uh, initially, it started in Africa and into Europe and has spread since into Australia and the Americas and, and now on every continent. We have active exploration projects going on looking for natural hydrogen resources. And this map shows uh, occurrences of, of uh, known occurrences of natural hydrogen. And, and I want to highlight the, the, the pink circles, which are, are locations where we have a, a convergence of, of known geothermal resources and also known hydrogen observations, which are places of, of particular interest uh, for us. And if we think about those these these geologic settings, uh, they tend to be volcanic, magmatic, hydrothermal settings. And in these settings, there's really no shortage of of, of chemical mechanisms, natural occurring processes that are that are capable of generating hydrogen. And and I've listed the most well known here on this slide. Um, and you'll note that most of them involve iron iron containing minerals uh, in in contact with water. Although um, there are some sulfur uh, reactions that can be very important, as well as purely uh, carbon carbon based, looking at methane uh, going to graphite. But in in general, most of this involves uh, iron rich minerals reacting with water at elevated temperatures, typically above two hundred degrees C. And if uh, if we think then about the the uh, the concepts of exploration for geothermal and and hydrogen resources, there's a significant amount of alignment in in terms of the critical factors that we need to take into account. So the things like the tectonic framework and heat flow and and sedimentary thicknesses are all uh, geologic uh, concepts and geologic uh, parameters that we need to need to characterize uh, very well in, in order to understand what the resource potential is, both for geothermal as well as for uh, natural hydrogen resources. And essentially, uh, what it comes down to is it, it's a, a question of water rock interaction over a period of time that uh, is then coupled with the potential for fluid entrapment and preservation that, that is the key to really understanding uh, the potential for natural hydrogen resources. But um, uh, many of these factors uh, that are important for, for addressing this issue are also uh, of great concern for geothermal resources. Uh, so then to sum up, uh, just uh, recap that hydrogen 
will play a critical role going forward to, to meet goals for, for net zero. Um, and we think now that there are likely large quantities of natural hydrogen in the subsurface. We simply just haven't looked for it in the right places with the right tools. And there are um, clearly uh, extensive synergies between uh, natural hydrogen and geothermal resources that we can exploit to help uh, move this forward. And if you want to learn more about the potential for natural hydrogen, I would recommend you uh, this recent uh, review article that, that was published in the journal Science um, earlier this year. Thank you so much for your attention.
Hi everyone, what a fantastic introduction to natural hydrogen by Jeff. Um, a 10 minute everything you need to know, which was brilliant. And one thing that rang loud and clear in Jeff's presentation is that, that need to understand the interaction between rocks, gas and water. So that fluid rock interaction. And to dive a little bit further into this subject, we have a geochemist, Eric Gulcher with us. I'm delighted to welcome him and he will and um, take us another step further into our understanding here. His presentation is going to be divided into two key segments. First, we'll hear the story of Iceland's discovery of natural hydrogen systems, and importantly, the role data played in that revolution. And then secondly, what we want to do is really try and outline how the geothermal com community can actually enhance our understanding of natural hydrogen systems. And this will include insights into data collection techniques, particularly around gas analysis. So without hesitating any longer, I welcome Eric Goucher. Please take it away, Eric. Okay. Hello, everyone. So I am Eric Gaucher, and uh, my... Um... My talk today is to, to make this bridge in between two new energies, so natural hydrogen and the geothermal energy. And you will see that, in fact, in the nature, uh, the, these two energies are already uh, bridged. Uh, and you have, uh, on, with these two pictures, uh, the white chimney of, uh, this is uh, underwater, uh, in, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so uh, you have this white chimney, it's plenty of hydrogen and it's also a geothermal uh, vent. So where the hot water is coming at the bottom of the ocean. And you see also the black smoker in the middle Atlantic Ridge, where in fact, the natural hydrogen, this new energy has been first discovered by the, by the people working on, on this subject. And uh, so you, we have the proof of, of the existence of this uh, natural hydrogen. So in the middle of the Atlantic, for example, with all those discoveries of uh, Lucky Strike, uh, Rainbow, uh, Lost City, for example. And by chance, we have also in the middle of the Atlantic, on this mid-Atlantic ridge, one island. And this island is the Iceland. And in Iceland, we, some, some researchers have made some nice uh, discoveries con concerning natural hydrogen. And in this paper uh, made by Valentin uh, Combodo uh, in the group of Isabel Moretti, they have observed, and, and you have all the small dots on this figure, where they have compared the hydrogen concentration you have in the gas coming in the, in, in the mid-Atlantic ridge, but also with the small dots that are the, the concentration you can observe in the geothermal fields of Iceland. So in fact, when you are producing the thermal water, the hydrothermal water and the vapor, you are also producing a huge quantity of hydrogen that can be in fact uh, produced if you have a gas separator in, in, in your installations. So the idea and the model they, they are proposing is that you have some entry of water, so metric water, for example, coming here um, in some fault. And the, the fresh water is reacting in the reservoir. And then you have a production of hydrogen that came uh, and can be released by the, the Earth and in the hot springs of Iceland, but also in the um, geothermal fields. And if you are asking for the, the volumes uh, of, of this, in fact, uh, the measurement uh, demonstrates that in the already installed geothermal power plants, you have a production of 1.17, uh, 16 kilotons of hydrogen every year. And this means that uh, you can win money with this if you are selling this uh, uh, quantity of hydrogen at, for example, two dollars per kilogram. You can win. You can make a profit of of two point three uh, million dollars per year. So, and given that the investment have, have been already done, uh, you just need a gas separator on the storage on the distribution system if you want to produce this hydrogen in your uh, geothermal power plant. So 
We have another example, for example, in the Pyrenees Mountains in the south of France, where with one of my students, we have demonstrated that we have a, a natural production of hydrogen because we have some uh, serpentinized mantle. So the serpentinized mantle are the kitchen where uh, we have uh, uh, the, the production of, of hydrogen. And this is again linked uh, to the infiltration of some meteoric water in an hydrothermal loop. And in the serpentinized mantle, we have a temperature that is high enough to produce hydrogen. And uh, when you are uh, measuring uh, the gases you have along major fault, in fact, you can find hydrogen seepages. So you can demonstrate that you have a production uh, of hydrogen uh, in, the, in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. And right now in France, we have two licenses of exploration for natural hydrogen in this area of the, of the Pyrenees. So now what to do if you want to demonstrate that you have uh, an hydrogen, so our interest, this interesting gas in your geothermal uh, water, uh, you have to measure, of course, the dissolved gas, so hydrogen, but also CO2, methane, and helium, for example, are very interesting um, gas that can help you to demonstrate that you have a kitchen that is producing hydrogen in depth. And so for that, you have to degas your water, and, and if you degas your geothermal water, you can have the chance to find directly uh, the hydrogen that is produced by in your well. But you can also demonstrate that you have a, a, na a natural hydrogen system using the isotopes of, of methane. And the abiotic methane has an isotopic signature very different from the thermogenic or the biogenic methane. And then you can demonstrate that you have a production of hydrogen because hydrogen is reacting with the natural CO2 that you have in your system and, and, and is able to produce methane. So the isotopes of methane demonstrate that you have a production of hydrogen in depth. And one, another gas that is very interesting is helium because helium can give you uh, some indication about the production of uh, uh, hydrogen. So if your production is made with, by radiolysis, you will find a lot of helium-4, so the isotope of helium, helium-4. If your production of, of hydrogen is linked to the serpentinization of the mantle, you will have more iron-3. So the isotopes of helium can also help you to understand what type of kitchen for your natural hydrogen you have in, in your system. Some new uh, isotopes, so the clumped isotope, deuterium, deuterium, uh, can also be done uh, on, on your, um, in your analysis uh, list. And uh, in this paper of Xavier, Xavier Marchenot, uh, we have published a new method for this uh, uh, clumped isotope, so deuterium, deuterium of hydrogen, of the hydrogen molecule. And then you have, and, and you can also have an, a precise value uh, of, of, your, uh, of the temperature of the production of your hydrogen in your system. So my take home message in this very short presentation is that natural hydrogen could increase the value of your geothermal project because in Iceland, for example, it's already economic. So if you have um, the, the right analysis, you, you have a demonstration that you have a, a natural hydrogen production in your system, and then you, you, you can produce this hydrogen if uh, the, your geothermal uh, field is favorable for that. Uh, to obtain uh, those data, uh, we need to make a systematic degassing of the geothermal waters in order to improve our understanding of the hydrogen systems and to con contribute also to new discoveries of, the new, of this new resource. And here on, on this map, uh, so Helen has produced uh, uh, a crossing, uh, has crossed the information of the geothermal fields and also the natural hydrogen uh, quantities that are known around the world. And in fact, we have a nice uh, correlation in between the two parameters. So really, I think we, we should have 
this uh, production of a natural hydrogen in geothermal fields. That's a new sub subject, but uh, can be a very interesting subject that can add value uh, to your geothermal project. So thank you for your attention. Okay, for our last 10 minute slot on natural hydrogen and geothermal systems, I'm delighted to welcome Gabrielle Pasquet from a field researcher who is going to highlight to us the process of natural hydrogen generation within high temperature geothermal systems. So he's he will educate us on the release of H2S during volcanic degassing, and his presentation will utilize cases once again from Iceland, but also from recent field work that he's done in Djibouti. So take it away, Gabrielle, and let's go. So um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Gabrielle Pasquet, and I'm going to present the production of hydrogen in geothermal system, particularly in volcanic zone, uh, with the case of Djibouti and uh, Iceland. Um, as Jeff and Eric were just starting to say, 
one of the great assets of hydrogen is that it can be formed by a wide variety of natural reaction, from mafic rocks such as basalt to ultra mafic rocks such as peridotites with the well-known serpentinization reaction to felsic rocks such as uh, granite from biotite or amphibole. In these various, ca various cases, the process involved in the oxidation of ferrous iron contained in certain minerals to ferric iron associated with the reduction of water to hydrogen. These reactions are possible over a wide temperature range, but have different production peaks depending on the phases involved. An alternative to water in the production of hydrogen, particularly in volcanic or hydrothermal systems, is H2S. During degassing, it combines with the uh, uh, omnipresent water in volcanic systems to form SO2 and hydrogen. Or it may combine with an iron phases to form pyrite or chalcopyrite and also hydrogen. Thus, the presence of pyrite in the rocks of the system can be an indicator of hydrogen production. Um, here is a plot showing hydrogen generation as a function of temperature. We could deduce that the higher temperature, the more hydrogen is produced, but we note that there is a lack of data below 150 degrees. Experiments are mainly focused on peridotites and olivine, but magnetite, amphibole, and siderite, for example, are also interesting uh, hydrogen gener generating minerals. What, what can also be said is that there is a lack of data for reaction involving H2S and therefore potentially pyritization. Now to present case studies of hydrogen exploration in high temperature geothermal area, I will start with the East African Rift. These large systems open up along three axes, the Red Sea on the northwest, the Gulf of Aden on the east, and the main Ethiopian Rift on the south. The floor and accretion axes are essentially basalt. Um, field studies were carried out to assess the hydrogen potential of some existing and future geothermal prospects. Various sites stand out, and I'm going to focus on one of them at Lake Asal in Djibouti. So since the 80s, many geothermal wells have been installed in the Asal Rift. And hydrogen has been measured at depths in the external margin up to 0.25%. Our surface, surface survey shows that hydrogen emanation are present in the axis, but not on the external margins. The first deduction that can be made is that uh, a cap rock is present uh, at depths on the margin, here potentially clays and yellow clastite. Furthermore, if we want to know the remnant potential of our basalt, considering a reaction where all the iron 2 is converted into iron 3, we can see that the chlorite from the propylytic geothermal zone are the most promising. Indeed, uh, basalt are poor in olivine uh, compared to peridotite, and the alteration reaction from basalt uh, with water uh, is going to form more clays-like uh, rocks uh, in an iron two rich rocks like uh, chlorite. But um, dehydrogenation process of chlorite can transform the iron two into iron three. With an ideal production where all the iron two came to uh, iron three, um, we can have uh, at the maximum uh, measurement, uh, 32 liters of hydrogen per kilo of rock. Obviously it's an ideal production, a maximum production. Puritization reactions from magnetite are not to be underestimated and are an essential potential source. In this case, the origin of the hydrogen is diverse, involving volcanic degassing with connection of axial faults to the magma magmatic chamber, 
ferritization and potentially chlorite oxidation. This propylytic zone is interesting because it will act both as a generating rocks and as a geothermal and hydrogen reservoir. In the case of Iceland, as Eric just present before, we can see that hydrogen is essentially present in the axial volcanic zone, particularly in high temperature geothermal zones. In geothermal fluids, hydrogen has been measured up to uh, 20.5 millimol per kilo and over uh, 57 volume percent in fumaroles in surface. Iceland demonstrates the role of salinity in hydrogen production, a producing a reaction with meteoric or glacial and seawater fluids. Most sites supplied with meteoric water show higher hydrogen concentration. Similar to the East African Rift, the origin of this hydrogen is a mix between iron II oxidation and water reduction, volcanic degassing, and also pyritization. Finally, the hydrogen is produced by many different reactions, which can be combined and is enhanced by the high temperatures of the geothermal fluid circulating in these rocks. The advantage of volcanic regions, such as Iceland or the East African Rift, is that despite lower hydrogen concentration, the gas flow is significant and continuous. On the large majority of sites, geothermal wells are already in production. So all that is needed now is to recover this hydrogen. Also, what is required now is long-term monitoring of this hydrogen, particularly at depths, in order to identify the reservoir and or cap rock and define an hydrogen system. Geothermal data are essential to understand the hydrogen system with data on temperatures, on fluids, on gas, and obviously on ge geological formations at depths. Thank you for your attention.